Okay, you may take a seat. Uh, we are blessed. So, this morning we're, we're so honored and privileged to have our dear friends Duncan and Kate with us. Just to give you a little bit of context, John and Carol Arnott, they, they swing by regularly. Um, and that's a great blessing to us. Well, they were the, the founders of uh, Catch the Fire and the pioneers of the move of God that, that broke out in January 1994. And we as a church and a ministry, this is one of our strongest connections. And we love Catch the Fire. And um, Duncan and Kate are now the, the successors. You know, they've had hands laid on for them to carry the ministry forward. And God is turning that wonderful ministry into a movement all over the world under the leadership of Duncan and Kate. They're here in the UK for two weeks. And guess what? They're with us for Sunday service. You know, there, there, are, so, there are so many places they could go. So church, do you know how blessed you are that God brings these amazing people to us? And we love what he's doing. So Duncan and Kate, we open our hearts to you. And church, we are going to give them a massive life spring honor and welcome. Amen. Come on, let's stand and bless them as they come. Thank you, guys. Thank you so much. Bless you. Oh. Wow, thank you everyone. Thank you so much. What a joy to be back here with you and the building has got bigger, the stage has moved and I said to Tony, yes, this is the right size auditorium for you um, because God's on the move and we are just so blessed. The kingdom of heaven is here very strongly and what he's doing amongst you is increasing and there is no lack, there is provision for every ministry, every family. And I saw that you were like a, a massive lighthouse in this region, not just the city, but the region and all the communities that you live in, that the light of Christ and the light of the kingdom is so strong here. And so we declare that the kingdom is advancing at Life Spring. And the church and all the ministries. And I see that it's like a time for each of you to say, Lord, where is my place? What is my place? How do I take my place? Because there's miraculous provision. There's signs and wonders. And um, I just want you to hold out your hand because there's substance in the kingdom. And I, I just see like the Lord is, is tickling your hands with his kingdom anointing. In this place. So each of you have got two hands, I hope. That just shows you how much God wants to give you of his kingdom in your hands. A double portion because we have two hands. But it's not just about the leadership. I see shoots of the kingdom springing up all over the place, all over the nations, and impossible things are happening. And I just saw the angel of the church of Lifespring getting very excited because we, re we ask you, Father, that you would release the angel to bring in the harvest to assist us in the ministry of the kingdom, in our workplaces, in our homes, in our communities. And we thank you that the harvest is coming in quickly. And we declare that there will be a multiplication, that there will be unusual and exceptional growth in your lives and in your community, your small groups. There'll be a multiplication of the ministries. And people are going to walk through this door because they know that they will get healed and they will get delivered and there will be freedom. So Lord, let the light of your kingdom be like a massive beacon in the Midlands in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you, darling. Ah. Thank you, Holy Spirit. Mm. Well, it's my joy uh, to 
Um, I guess, am, am I the last in the month of stewardship? It's my joy to round up the, the uh, month of stewardship. And uh, Kate and I are very, very passionate about the, the kingdom of heaven. And we love it that we have grace to access the invisible realm of the kingdom where there's an infinite amount of treasure. There's an infinite amount of treasure. When we walk in the kingdom with a kingdom perspective, and, and not just a kingdom perspective, but conscious of the kingdom, more conscious of the kingdom than the ground that we're walking on, more conscious of the king than the air that we breathe, when we walk in that realm, we never lack because we're always walking with our daddy. And our daddy is really, really rich. You have a really rich dad. And because you have a really rich dad, you have a very big inheritance. You are going to inherit billions and billions and billions. You're going to inherit billions. And uh, Abba. And it's all because you are a son or a daughter. For an inheritance, you don't have to do anything. You receive an inheritance because of who you are. You receive an inheritance because of who your dad is. You don't receive an inheritance because you do anything to earn it. That's why when the man came to Jesus and said, what must I do to inherit eternal life? And he was a very rich young man who, being young, could only be rich because he had just received all those riches from his dad. Think about it, you know. It was before cryptocurrency. So you could, you could only be really rich when you were young if you'd been given all of that money. And he came to Jesus and he said, what must I do to receive eternal life? And Jesus gave him an answer in keeping with the stupidity of his question. I shouldn't say stupidity, that's not a God word. But you get what I'm saying? With the foolishness of his question, the ignorance of his question, because out of all of them in that, in that vicinity who could have and should have known better, you don't have to do anything to inherit. You inherit because of who you are. And that's what Jesus came to give us. He came to give us himself and for us to simply receive because we believe. And in receiving him, we inherit everything. Who he is, his father, and all that belongs to his daddy and to him. And so it's my joy to talk about the grace of giving. So uh, I'm going to ask you to turn, please. We're going to really spend most of our time um, in Luke 16, but just by way of kind of just to set the scene, I want you to turn to Genesis and chapter 4. And I want you to just bear in mind, okay, that this is the very, very first human story after the fall. The very first human story after the fall. Genesis 4 verse 1. We're talking about the grace of giving. Now Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bore Cain and said, I have acquired a man from the Lord. Everybody say a man. Then she bore again, and this time his brother Abel. Now, Abel was a keeper of sheep, but Cain was a tiller of the ground. And in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of the fruit of the ground to the Lord. I want you to notice that Cain is the very first recorded giver in all of human history. Cain is the very first recorded giver in all of human history. Abel also brought of the firstborn of his flock and of their fat. I want you to notice that Abel didn't give. Abel brought. So let's see which of the two God was pleased with. 
Was he pleased with the very first giver or was he pleased with the very first bringer? And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry and why has your countenance fallen? If you do well, will you not be accepted? And if you do not do well, sin lies at the door. Apparently you can be a giver and not be doing well. Woo! It's extraordinary. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes to your true heart and the true heart of the king in the kingdom this morning? Mmm! And it's sin's desire is for you, is to devour you. But you must learn to rule over it. My Bible, New King James says, but you should rule over it. Now Cain talked with Abel, his brother. And it came to pass when they were in the field that Cain rose up against Abel, his brother, and killed him. And the Lord said to Cain, where is Abel, your brother? And he said, I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And he said, what have you done? The voice of your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. So now you're cursed from the earth, which has opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you till the ground, it will no longer yield its strength to you. A fugitive and a vagabond, you shall be on the earth. Mm. And I want to just finish that portion of scripture with that. Extraordinary to think that the very first story of human in human activity in human history after the fall is a story of a man who decided that he wanted to give to God. And that same man who decided he wanted to give to God a few days later murdered his brother on account of the fact that his gift was not received. And it's interesting that if you look closely, you'll see that it says that the Lord had no regard for Cain or his offering. And here's what the Lord opened my eyes to just a few weeks ago. You see, when it comes to giving, it's really, really important that we have the right motive and the right starting point. And it's all down to an understanding of worth. You see, Cain came to God with what Cain wanted to justify himself with in his hand to show God that he, had something, that he was and had something of worth to give God, that he was worthy to give to God. Cain, you could say, was the inventor of religion. God, you're going to have to accept me now because look what I'm giving you. And aren't I amazing on account of my gift? I've worked really hard tilling the ground. Look at me go. And I'm going to take something of that. And because I'm so worthy, I'm going to give you a portion of what I have. And wow, aren't I generous in giving it to you? Aren't I special on account of my gift? How do we know that? That that was his motive? Because of the fact that when God says, I don't actually respect your gift. He got really angry. You see, if you, if you have invested yourself into your gift, if you're caught up in how much you're giving and how amazing your gift is and how hard you worked to give what you have, God will not have respect for your gift and you will be mad and feel rejected that he rejected you. Cain, on the other hand, sorry, excuse me, Abel, on the other hand, had a completely different motive Absolutely different motive altogether. His motive was that he saw the worth of Jesus. And because he saw that God was so worthy, not any worth in himself, but because God was so worthy, he wanted to bring to God something that would somehow reveal God's worth. And he realized, oh my goodness, you are so worthy and you're so special and you're so full of worth. I'm going to bring you my best. The best of what I'm stewarding. 
I'm going to bring it to you. Because actually everything belongs to you anyway. You're the only worthy one. Here you are. I'm bringing back to you what belongs to you. And by the way, I'm bringing the best to you. You have the very first of what belongs to you. I'm returning to you what belongs to you. Because you're worthy. Not because I have something of worth or I'm something of worth, but because you're worthy. When, we, when our life is centered into the worth of Jesus, everything we do will be motivated by his preeminence and not our own goodness. Everything. We even realize that when we receive daddy's love, we're not receiving daddy's love because we're special. We're receiving daddy's love because Jesus is special and we have believed in Jesus and we're one with Jesus. And so now we get to enjoy the specialness of Jesus in our union with him. When we get healed up in our hearts, we realize that yes, we're the beneficiaries of that healing, but it's really all for Jesus. That the more healed I become, the more he gets to experience his preeminence in and through me. And not so that I can become someone special. I am special and I have become someone special. And you are special and you become someone special because of Jesus in you. And you in him. So now I want you to turn to Luke 16 with that in mind, okay? With that in mind. You see, I've realized that the grace of giving is grace. Grace is what we receive that we don't deserve. Mercy is not getting what we deserve. Grace is getting everything that we don't deserve. Can you see the difference? The grace of giving is that by, I believe the grace of giving is actually right there with Abel, bringing to God what belongs to God, and in return, receiving from God access to everything. See, when we return to God what belongs to God, God is like, oh, you get it. This world belongs to me? Okay. You're doing everything from a motive of me being blessed, and me being famous in you, and me revealing my world, my love to the world? Okay, I can trust you. All right, here's a blank check. Write whatever you want. Luke 16, verse 1. Holy Spirit, would you open our eyes? Jesus also said to his disciples. Now, this is right after the prodigal son story. By the way, did you notice that it said that that Eve said, I've acquired a man. It was fascinating to me that she didn't say, I now have a son. She said, I've acquired a man. Because Adam and Eve knew God as creator, they didn't know him as father. And so when they first produced a son, they didn't realize he's a son because they didn't realize that they were a father and a mother. They just thought they were created beings. They didn't realize they were a mom and dad. And says, oh, we've, we've acquired a man. And it's fascinating to me that someone showed me this just the other day. They came running up to me after I'd been sharing at our own home church uh, a message along these lines. And they said, I noticed that in chapter 5, which is the next chapter, it starts off with, and uh, Adam knew his wife Eve, and they gave birth. She gave birth to a son and named him Seth. Somehow when they lost Abel and they learned the lesson that I've just explained to you that life is all about God's worth and not our worth, but his worth, suddenly they clicked in. Oh, wow, through Abel we've been able to see how amazing God is. And what makes him most amazing is not just that he's a creator, he's our dad. He's our dad. And by the time Seth was conceived and born, they were able to say, oh, If he's our dad and we were made like him, that makes us a dad. Therefore, he must be our son. Son, I love you so much. Cain grew up an orphan because they didn't understand that God was a dad. Seth grew up as a son because by this time, Abel had helped them to recognize 
He's first a worthy. He's a worthy and he's a father. Anyway, so now here we are right after the prodigal son. He says, and I didn't even see this till this morning. He also said to his disciples. In other words, what we're about to read is tied to the message of the father's love. He also said to his disciples, there was a certain rich man who had a steward or a manager. And an accusation was brought to him that this man was wasting his goods or his belongings. So he called him and said to him, what is this that I hear about you? Give an account of your stewardship for you can no longer be steward. Then the steward said to, within himself, what shall I do? For my master's taking the stewardship away from me. I cannot dig. I'm ashamed to beg. I've resolved what to do, that when I'm put out of the stewardship, they may receive me into their houses. And so he called every one of his master's debtors to him and said to the first, how much do you owe my master? And he said, a hundred measures of oil. So he said to him, take your bill and sit down quickly and write 50. And then he said to another, and how much do you owe? And so he said, a hundred measures of wheat. And he said to him, take your bill and write 80. So the master commended the unjust steward because he had dealt shrewdly. For the sons of this world are more shrewd in their generation than the sons of light. And I say to you, make friends for yourselves by unrighteous mammon, that when you fail, they may receive you into an everlasting home. At this point, we're like Jesus. What in the world is going on here? It, 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 what? You're commending the unrighteous steward for unrighteousness? What? Let's read on though. He who is faithful in what is least is faithful also in much. And he who is unjust in what is least is unjust also in much. In other words, if you, when you're young, are not able to return a tithe to the Lord of 10% of your 100 pounds of pocket money that you receive a month, you will never return the tithe of 100 million. Because if you are not faithful with little, you will not be faithful with much. I can't tell you how, as a, as a leader, as a leader of a global movement with hundreds and hundreds of churches and, and, and as informational access to the wider body of Christ around the world, I cannot tell you how many people I meet, business people that I meet, that tell you things like, when I make it to such and such a level, I am going to be so generous with my giving. And people who are not business people who say things like, when I win the lottery, I'm going to give so much to the church. I've had people come up to me and say, you know what, I'm, I just want you to know that I've got this thing going on and when that thing follows through, I'm going to be giving millions to the church. Let me tell you something. What you do with 10 pounds out of 100 pounds will determine what you do with 10 million out of 100 million. Simple. You will never, ever be more generous with 100 million than you are with 100 pounds. Because 100 million will open up a world to you that's so big, there's no way you'll ever let go of 10 million. Not in a million years. Holy Spirit, open our eyes. The ones who are faithful in what is little will be faithful also in much. And those who are not faithful in what is the smallest will not be faithful in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the unrighteous mammon, who will commit to your trust the true riches? And if you have not been faithful in what belongs to another man, then who will give you what is your own? No servant can serve two masters, for either they will hate the one and love the other, or else they will be loyal to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Woo. 
You cannot serve God and serve mammon. You'll either love the one and hate the other or the other way around. This, this is such a blessing, everybody, because right here in this parable contains an amazing dynamic that Abel understood, that we can understand this morning. I don't know about you, but I've never really understood this parable. But a very, very wealthy and successful man opened my eyes while I was standing on his $6 million boat, which was one of his smaller boats. He has three airplanes, and he loves Jesus with all of his might. And this man said to me, have you ever considered the parable of the unrighteous manager? And I said, no, sir, I haven't. And he said, I've never understood it, he said. And I said, me neither. Until one day, the Holy Spirit showed me something he said. And I said, and you know, when someone who has three airplanes is about to say something, you're like, I'm all ears. You know what I'm saying? Not because you want their three airplanes, but because obviously it's helped success. And he said, the Holy Spirit showed me Jesus is not commending the unrighteous steward for his unrighteousness. He's commending the unrighteous steward for understanding that the world has a system and using that system to his advantage. And if you can use an unrighteous system in the world to your advantage, how much more, if you operate in the system of the kingdom, will you be blessed? That's amazing. And when you realize that our daddy, who's the king of glory, has put into the kingdom of heaven the opportunity for us to, to align ourselves to the grace of the system of the kingdom, we can prosper in the kingdom of light in the same way that in this world, if you learn the system of this world, you can prosper in this world. That doesn't mean that that, that, that prosperity is heaven's endorsement on your life. It just means there's a system in the world. You discovered it and you're using it to your advantage. If you can do that in this evil world, how much more in the righteous world can you prosper when you discover and start to utilize and align your life in submission to the lordship of the king and his system in the kingdom? So I began a pursuit of the system in the secret place with God. And God began to show me that there are four keys to the system of the kingdom. Number one, returning. Number two, sowing. Number three, giving. Notice that number three, giving, is after the first two. You don't even get to giving until the first two are in place in the kingdom. You might in the world, but we're talking about the system of the kingdom. And then number four is lending. If you do those four things, you will align with the system of the kingdom and the grace of giving will be upon you and God will prosper your life and you will steward his, his kingdom in the most remarkable way. So number one, returning. What's returning? Returning is the tithe. The tithe. You do not give the tithe. We do not give the tithe. We bring the tithe. And the tithe was not discovered. The tithe is not something that belongs in the system of Moses alone. The tithe predates Moses. The tithe is a joy to be discovered, and Abel was the first person to discover it. The tithe is right there as the number one foundational foundation stone of the system of the kingdom. We return to God what belongs to God, the tithe. In other words, we realize, let me start again. In other words, God realizes that we get it, that everything belongs to God. Everything. Even each other. Your car, it's my car. Your house, it's my house. 
Kate and I flew here on our private jet. We just had to learn to share it with 300 other passengers. <laughs> Do you understand? We drive on our roads. When, because everything belongs to God, everything belongs to us when we're in God. As long as we show God and give Him assurance that we understand it's not ours to hold on to and steward our way. And it's not ours to use to somehow justify our worth before God. That our bank account that's full of the money that we've worked really hard for is not our means of justifi justification before God. That in actual fact, all of that money that we worked hard for, we didn't work for money, we worked for joy, and all that money belongs to him. And it's our joy to return back to him what belongs to him. Where do we return it? We return it to the storehouse. You can read that in Malachi 3.10, the storehouse. This is your storehouse, everybody. And the beautiful thing about God is he's so amazing that he says, when you return the tithe to me, when you bring to me the first of the first fruits, you get to then steward everything that's mine, and you get to do it, at, and the best place to do it is right in your church family, right here. So you get to benefit anyway. What do you think? You come in here, and all the lights are running on God? And you think that God just dropped all the money to buy this place? It just fell out of heaven? No, it didn't. It was given through God's people who realized that everything they gave, none of it was theirs, all belonged to God, and it was their joy to give it back to him. And now they're living in the amazing goodness of this phenomenal building in the middle of Wolverhampton. <laughs> and all the glory goes to God. See, I've preached in this church for a long time, off and on, and I can remember when this church building didn't exist the way it exists. I remember before the foyer was the foyer. I remember when there was a, a line right there and this was a blank space and all of that was finished. I remember it. And the reason why we're all sitting in this expansive thing is because the vision that God put in Tony and Ursula's hearts and the people that have walked with them all of them understand it all belongs to God. It's all his. And you can always tell somebody who's not a tither because they grumble about the church asking for money. So next time you grumble about the church asking for money, be careful, you're giving it away, that you're very stingy, <laughs> that you give little out of your abundance, and that you don't understand that what you have doesn't belong to you. It belongs to God. And God actually says to the Israelites in Malachi, I've got this against you. What have we, you got against us? That you're robbing from me. Robbing? Are you kidding? Yep. Did you know that you can be a son of your heavenly daddy and rob from your daddy? Okay, let me tell you a quick story so that you understand. So, I was born in Jos, which is in Plateau State, which is in a country called Nigeria. And I bet there's a few people from Nigeria. Okay. In the name of Jesus. Uh, turn with me, Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. Okay. Oh, God, let's go now. <laughs> okay. All right. Now, where was I? <laughs> where was I? I was telling you, oh, yes, thank you. So, here I am, 12 years old, and... Mum and dad sent me to boarding school in England, so I had to fly on an airplane to get back home to Nigeria. And so my first or second vacation back home, uh, my eyes had been opened to the world, and I needed some money to go 
and buy some things that I wanted to buy. I won't go into the detail because I don't want to get distracted. But I didn't have the money, but I knew my dad did. So while my dad was out at work and my mom was in the kitchen not looking, I opened my dad's undies drawer, the top drawer. And I looked in there and there was a huge wadj of Naira. Now, Naira is the currency of Nigeria. And I had never seen as much money in all my life. And back in those days, a Naira was worth a lot of money. So I just... <laughs> and I just helped myself to a few notes, stuffed them in my pocket, closed the drawer, and walked out. And then I went and spent the money. I was a son and a thief all at once. Be careful that you're not a son of your heavenly daddy and a thief in his eyes. One day the Lord said, I want you to tell your dad. Now this is many years, decades later. By this time I was a, an adult man. And the Lord said, I want you to tell your father how you used to steal from him. I said, are you kidding me? No way. That's non-negotiable, Lord. And he said, no, I want you to tell him. I said, I, he's going to kill me. No way. And I plucked up the courage. I told my dad. He laughed. He said, I said, Dad, I'll pay you all back. He said, it's okay, son. I knew all along. <laughs> Do you know how many millions, hundreds of millions of Christians love God, are his sons and daughters, and he knows that they're stealing from him left, right, and center all the time. I don't want to be that kind of son, do you? I just don't want to be. So, number one foundation of the system of the kingdom, return back to God what belongs to him. Bring the tithe to the storehouse and let it go. It wasn't yours. But here's the grace of giving in that. When you return back to God what belongs to him, he now says, okay, fantastic. Now I know that you know it's all mine, so whatever you do from now on, you are not stealing. You're stewarding. Because he knows if you can return the tithe to him, you've got a brilliant heart. And so the next thing in the system of the kingdom is sowing. You see, I can't tell you how many people come up to me and they say, I don't understand. I, I, I'm a tither, but I have no prosperity. Oh. <laughs> I'm tithing, but I just don't seem to be getting anywhere. Well, that's because the tithe is not your seed. You have no harvest from a tithe. You're bringing to God what belongs to him. And it's slaughtered. When Abel brought to God the first of his flock, he slayed it. And it was pleasing to God. There's no harvest from your tithe. What the tithe does is the tithe gives you the perfect condition for every seed that you ever sow in the future to be a fantastic seed. Imagine the tithe is like a greenhouse. That's the best way that I can describe it. When you construct the greenhouse, within the greenhouse is all of the necessary, perfect environment for the maximum harvest. But you still have to sow into the soil. So when you sow the seed, you reap back 30, 60, 100 fold from the seed. If you want to prosper in the system of the kingdom, you return to the Lord what belongs to him, but then you sow. You sow. You sow. Whatever. Someone taught me this. A man of God taught me this. Whatever it is that you desire in a harvest, calculate one one hundredth of it and sow it and trust God by faith to receive that harvest. So you need a car. Let's say the car's 10,000 pounds. And you'd like, you find out the car you'd like is a Volkswagen with, you know, all the bells and whistles and used, it's 10,000 pounds. Fantastic. Here it is. And it's a 2016, 2018, low miles. 
10,000 pounds, what do you do? What is one one hundredth of 10,000? It's just 100 pounds. That's how good God is. You take that 100 pounds, you find out who needs a car, and you sow that 100 pounds into their car fund. And watch what God will do for them and you. As we say in Hausa, Shikenan. In other words, that's it. Now wait and watch. No farmer's anxious about the seed in the ground. They just know. It's called faith. I know that seed is going to bring a harvest. Number three, and this is why God is so cool and why he does things so well. Number three is giving. What's the difference between giving and sowing? Sowing is what you do to receive a harvest. Giving is what you let no one know that you do because you just want to be like God and be an extravagant giver. There's no motive to receive, to get, to have a harvest. Nothing. You just, out of extravagance, want to give. And you do it in secret. You don't let the right hand know what the left hand's doing. Kate and I know what it's like to receive a check in the amount of $1,200,000 for our church when we were desperate in 2012 to purchase our first building. We needed $1.4 million. It was a total miracle. Some of you who've been here for a long time and heard me preach on that, you'll know. That was an amazing, amazing time. To receive an anonymous check for $1,200,000 will change your life forever, especially if you only have $2,000 in your account and you need to buy a building for $1.4 million. Somebody somewhere, to this day we don't know who it was, somebody somewhere was so good at giving secretly 100 pounds, $100, $1,000, just like some of you here may have just sown a 1,000 pounds gift to this church, not even looking for a harvest, just come out of the goodness of your heart, boom, 1,000 pounds, bam, just like that. And you don't realize that you're getting ready to be somebody that can one day write checks for a million pounds with that same faith, love. Come on. Number four, lending. Lending is about helping somebody learn to become a good steward. See, not everybody is benefited by benevolence. And we don't tend to think, you know, with all the teaching out there in the world about, you know, how bad debt is and borrowing. Yes, I agree with it all, but the Bible tells us. Psalm chapter 15 verse 5 says that he or she who lends without interest will never be shaken. In other words, there's something in the kingdom, and it's number four in the system the Lord showed me. It's not what you do first. It's number four. It's a long way down. It's not what you do all the time. But there are certain circumstances where you will lift the esteem of a brother or sister when you lend to them. And you set out the terms of the loan and you give them the opportunity to learn stewardship and to return the loan as agreed. And as they do that, they grow in their esteem. And when they see you, they don't put their head down because they know they're doing it the way you set it out. And the Lord says, if you do it and lend it to them as if you're lending it to me, and they fail in their giving back to you, just cancel it. Won't I take care of you? It's so much more. Let's stand, everybody. I've shared with you some... some, uh, some of the deepest things of my heart, actually. And it's a joy to share it with you guys because they're only the deepest things of my heart because they're things straight out of the heart of our Heavenly Daddy. And I want you to know that God wants to extravagantly bless you because He's handpicked you to be somebody that he can then use to extravagantly bless the world. But he knows that he can bless the world best if he can give you access 
to what only belongs to him. So that you're not living out of your finite resources. You're living in full access to his infinite resources. Just before Kate and I bought our first building, now we've sold that building, we're in another building. But just before then, the Lord reminded us of a vision that a prophet shared with us in 2008, four years earlier. And in this vision, he wrote to us to say, I was in England, he's South African, now living in America, but he said, I was in England, and I was at a New Frontiers conference, he was part of that movement, and all of a sudden, the Lord took me in a vision into heaven. And I went into heaven, and this time, the Lord said, I'm going to take you somewhere, come with me. And he took him, and he opened this door that they'd never been in, And as he opened the door, he entered into a room, which is not even a room. He just entered into this endless, this space of endless horizon of treasure. Literal treasure. An endless horizon of treasure. And the Lord said to him, oh, hi, Barbara. And the Lord said to him, this is the treasure storehouse, my treasure storehouse. And you can come in anytime you want because you're my son. And just as he said that, he said, I noticed out of the corner of my eye that we weren't alone in the room. I was astonished. And as I turned and looked, there was Duncan and Kate. And they were just big old sacks, helping themselves to all the treasure, swung it over their shoulders, and you just walked out as if you owned the place. And the Lord says, tell Duncan... I'm giving them land, buildings, and nations. No, land, peoples, and nations. Buildings, people, and nations. I'm sorry. I have to check with my wife. Close your eyes. What we do in the secret place determines what God does in our lives in the public place. And for those of you who it just tithing's not a New Testament thing, it's Old Testament. Well, so is Passover, but aren't you glad that Jesus is the Passover lamb? Tithing is not Old Testament. Tithing is an eternal joy to be discovered. And I want you to get right with God right now. Those of you that have been robbing from God, just get right with Him right now. And make a decision in your heart. You know what? From now on, I'm going to return back to God what belongs to him. And the thing about the tithe is God is the one who decides where the tithe goes. And he said, I want you to bring it to the storehouse. And I think that's part of it. So God takes away our right to be the person who decides what to do with our money. And for those of you who are returning the tithe, but you're not seeing a harvest, I want you to just ask the Holy Spirit, Lord, would you teach me how to be a good farmer, how to be a good sower? For those of you doing all of that, but you want to learn also how to be a giver, where you lend to the Lord by giving to the poor. Make a decision, Lord, right now I want to become a really good giver. And then for those of you who want to learn the joy of lending, we lent to a friend who owed the IR, that owed the tax man a lot of money. And the Lord said, don't give him anything. I want you to lend to him. And we lent him a certain amount of money. We set out the terms and he faithfully paid it all back over a three-year term. And I tell you what, to this day, he's one of our best friends. And he's prospering. So thank you, Holy Spirit. Would you let the grace of giving fall upon this church? In Jesus' name, amen.